You're welcome to the first lecture of STAT 111, Introduction to Statistics and Probability. In this lecture, we'll be looking at introduction to data collection. We would learn how statistics is used. We would also know the various sources of data. We would also learn the types of data used in business and elsewhere. And we would also be looking at some vocabulary of statistics. We would introduce you briefly to data collection. There are two important concepts in statistics and probability. We would ask, why would you study statistics? We're going to present to you various uses of statistics and why it is important to study statistics. Here, we we'll introduce two important concepts, statistics on one hand and probability on the other. There are two main types of variables used in many fields referred to as non-stochastic or deterministic and stochastic or random variables. Stochastic variables are random variables that have an associated probability structure. Example is tossing a fair die or a coin. In tossing a die or a coin, we do not know in advance what number would show up. However, we can quantify the likelihood of such an event occurring. With non-stochastic variables, they are deterministic in nature without any probability attachment. Example could be interest rate or annuity calculation based on fixed time periods. We could also look at number of females in this class as an example. What is the purpose of this presentation? The main purpose of this presentation is to equip the student with basic ideas in statistics, its usefulness, and various applications. So, at the end of this lesson, the student should be able to define and explain what statistics is and its usefulness. Two, to identify types of data and how they are used. Three, to identify three key areas where statistics can be applied. Four, to explain the levels of measurement in statistics and its usefulness. Five, to distinguish between samples and populations, sensors and sample surveys. Six, to explain the difference between discrete and continuous variables. We would be looking at the evaluation of stochastic variables. This requires the basic use of probability and statistical tools. We would be focusing now on statistical techniques and later on our, uh, our attention will be drawn to concepts in, in probability theory. We would look at the definition of statistics. 
Statistics is used for long range planning purposes. So we are we use statistics to answer long range or long run planning questions. The word statistics has two meanings. In real common usage, statistics refers to numerical facts and figures, what we normally refer to as data. For example, the numbers that represent the diastolic blood pressure of a patient. We could also look at the heart rate of a patient. We could also look at the starting salary of a typical university graduate. These are examples of statistics in the sense of the word statistics. The second meaning of statistics refers to the field or discipline of study. Statistics in this sense is a field of study concerned with the collection, summarization, organization, description, and analysis of data. The second arm of this definition is drawing inferences about the data when only part of the data is observed. In other words, the definition of statistics that has been labeled as one in the rightful sense collectively is known as descriptive statistics. So this deals with all methods that we use in collecting data, in summarizing data, and in describing the data. They can be charts as well as graphs. These are collectively known as descriptive statistics. Then, in the second arm, where we use the data that we have generated on part of the data set observed to make inference or conclusions, draw conclusions uh, for making decisions concerning the entire data set based on just the part that we have collected. In general, statistics consists of a set of methods and rules for organizing and interpreting observations. These statistical procedures help ensure that observations are presented and interpreted in an accurate and informative way. Statistics, like almost all fields of study, has two aspects, the theoretical and the applied. Theoretical or mathematical statistics deals with the development, derivation, and proof of statistical theorems, formulas, rules, and laws. On the other hand, applied statistics involves the application of theorems, formulas, rules, and laws to solve real world problems. In summary, the role of statistics is to assist you to collect, organize, summarize, analyze, and communicate quantitative information for decision making. Let us look at some uses of statistics. Statistical techniques are used extensively by managers in marketing, accounting, quality control, consumer preferences, professionals, sports people, hospital administrators, educators, politicians, physicians, and what have you. 
statistics or statistical techniques are mostly used in every field of endeavor. Statistics as a subject is used for description, comparison, projection, prediction, and decision making. Let us look at a few uses of statistics in relation to governments. Governments need to correctly collect, process, and analyze statistical data on national output, earnings, expenditure, imports, inflation, exports, employment, population growth and decline, health, in order to make rightful decisions. Government has mandated the Ghana Statistical Service to collect most of these data at the national level for government use. Now let us look at statistics and the district council. District councils need statistics on education, on welfare, on transportation, on infrastructure and recreational need, etc. to plan for the development of a district or an area. Let us look at statistics and business. Various firms need statistics on production sales, payrolls, capital expenditure, and depreciation, etc., to effectively make correct decisions and projections. Statistics and other professions. Statistical analysis are used in practically every profession. Statistics are mainly used, for example, in testing the efficacy of an alternative production technique within an industry. It is also used in testing the effectiveness of a new drug in medicine. It can be used in testing the effectiveness of fertilizer on a particular crop yield. It could also be used in analyzing results of a drug rehabilitation program in sociology. Could also be used in testing product design or packaging that maximizes sales in business. It could also be used in forecasting voting patterns in politics. So with these examples, we have seen that statistics almost permeate every field of endeavor. Now, we will turn our attention to some terminologies in statistics. Broadly speaking, applied statistics can be divided into two areas, descriptive statistics and inferential statistics. Descriptive statistics comprises of methods for organizing, presenting, and summarizing data using tables, graphs, and summary measures. It is about presenting data in an informative way. Inferential statistics also comprise of methods that use sample results to help make decisions or predictions or inferences about a population from which the sample data was sought. Let us now look at the definition of a variable. A variable is a characteristic or condition that changes from different elements. Example can be the diastolic blood pressure, the heart rate of a patient, or a test score in, say, statistics and probability. Here, we would also look at a population. 
Anytime we talk about a population, we are referring to a collection of all items or persons or places or things of interest in a particular study on which we want to draw a conclusion. It is convenient to refer to the individual person, places or things of which the population is composed as the elements of the population. Frequently, especially when the elements of a population are human beings, we refer to an individual member of the population as a subject. A sample is a set of individuals, places or things, selected from a population usually intended to represent the population in a study. A descriptive value for a population is known as a parameter. It is a numerical measure that describes in summary fashion the characteristic of the population. A statistic is therefore a numerical measure that describes a characteristic of a sample. The discrepancy between a sample statistic and its corresponding population parameter is what is known as sampling error. So note sample and statistics as against population and parameters in this very slide. On the left hand side of this slide, we have a population. And from this population, we randomly select a sample that we wish to study to describe the population. In doing so, you realize that a parameter starts with P and it is a measure that describes a characteristic obtained on a population. A statistic on the other hand, starts with S, and it's also a measure obtained on a sample to describe the sample. So note population and parameter P as against P, sample and a statistic S against S. So on this slide, we see a diagrammatic representation of what we perceive a sampling error to be. So on the left hand side, you see the distribution of a population and its middle, because it is bell shaped, its middle specifies the average, which is the population mean. And then when you shift towards the sample, the sample also has its distribution very similar to the population distribution. And in the middle, you have the population, the sample mean. The sample mean is used as an estimate of the population mean when it is not known. The discrepancy we see between the population parameter, which is the population mean, and the sample mean is what is referred to as sampling error. Now, let us look at some definitions. A census and a sample survey. A survey which includes every member of the population is referred to as a complete enumeration or a census. While a survey which collects information 
from only a portion of the population is regarded as a sample survey. Methods of collecting a sample data from the population we would look at a few of those. The first that we would look at is the simple random sample. With a simple random sample, each member of the sample in the sum each member in the population has an equal chance of being selected in the sample. With systematic sampling, we randomly select a starting point and take every case piece of data from a list of the population. We refer to K as the sampling interval. We would look at this much later in various subsequent examples. Then we have stratified sample. A stratified sample is where the population is subdivided into various groups we will refer to as strata. And sampling or samples are taken from within each these strata. These strata are such that they are based on what we refer to as uh, stratif stratification variable. This variable should possess the quality of splitting the data into various groups such that within each strata or within each stratum, the elements are homogeneous. They are very similar to themselves. But among any two groups, members of one group against members of another group are heterogeneous. That is, they are very dissimilar. Cluster sampling or a cluster sample is very similar to stratified sampling. Here, the whole population is also subdivided into various groups we refer to as cluster. These clusters are such that elements within each cluster are very dissimilar, heterogeneous. But when you take the clusters, elements within among the clusters are homogeneous. Now let us look at types of data. Data are simply values, observations or measurements of a variable or a characteristic of interest. For example, a set of scores on a statistics test. Sources of statistical data can be put into two main categories, primary as well as secondary sources. When data used in a statistical set study are collected under control and supervision of the person or organization making that particular study, then that data is termed primary. However, when a person or an organization using such data is not responsible for the data collection or it is not under the person's supervision, then we refer to such data as secondary. A user of secondary data is not answerable to the data set. It is the primary source that is answerable to the data. 
some examples of primary sources. Primary sources of data can be data obtained from a political survey or data obtained from an experiment or data that is observed. All these data sets are from primary sources. Whoever collects these data actually wants to use the data. So the person will be answerable. So it is a primary source. Secondary sources are when an individual gets hold of census data and analyzes census data. Note that census says are compiled by the Ghana Statistical Service. They are responsible for census data. Users are not responsible. So that will be secondary source. Also, when you gather data from print media or journal, or some data that is published on the internet, then that data becomes second, because you are obtaining this information from a secondary source. So this organogram splits variables into various types. So we have qualitative on the left-hand side and we have quantitative on the right-hand side. Qualitative variables are also known as categorical variables. They have values that can only be placed into categories. Example can be a yes or no, which is known as a dichotomous variable, or a boy and a girl, man and woman, married or unmarried. These are dichotomous variables. Then we may have polynomic variables. For instance, when you talk of a brand of PC, the PC I'm currently using is an HP. There is a Dell computer, there are various other uh, uh, types of uh, uh, brands of PCs. And so once you have various brands of PC, that would give you various categories. Or, uh, it's a polynomic, categorical, quantitative, qualitative variable. Then we have quantitative or what we refer to as numerical variables. These are variables that are values that actually represent quantities. And among these, we could have, among these, we could have quantitative variables that are discrete in nature. Example is the number of children in a given family, the strokes on a golf hole are various examples, the number of students that are lit for this class is another example. Here, the variables of interest take values 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. These are discrete values. Then we have another type of quantitative or numeric variables that are continuous in nature. Here, a continuous variable takes on values, every value within a continuum. So example is 
the amount of tax one pays, the weight of a student, are various examples of continuous three hours. So let's look at these examples quickly and example one says that in each of the following examples as attribute identify whether the attribute is qualitative or quantitative and the first example is the residential hall of each student in this class. Some of you have residents in the Kwafu Hall, in Commonwealth Hall, in Volta Hall, and uh, the other halls. When we label these halls even with numbers, these numbers are only for purposes of identifying which or all each student belongs to. These numbers are not used to perform anything. And so such a variable is actually referred to as a qualitative variable. Number two, the amount of gasoline pumped by the next 10 customers at the local Unimat. The amount of gasoline would be continuous or numeric variable because amount can take on any value within a continuum. This amount could be in terms of liters or it could be in terms of monetary uh, value of the liters or gallons or, or so. The amount of radon in the basement of each of 25 homes in a new development. I will leave you to worry about the others. We would look at it uh, with the class uh, with the teaching as assistance assigned to your various classes. Right. Example two, we are asked to identify each of the following as examples of qualitative or numeric variables. So we have temperature in Accra at 12 p.m. on any given day. Certainly, temperature is a measurement on a continuous scale. Two, the make of an automobile driven by each faculty member. This will be qualitative and this will be categorical variable. I'll leave the others for you to do. Now let's turn our attention to levels of measurement. Levels of measurement offer a very quantitative definition of variables attributes. When one understands the different scales of measurement, it, allow, it allows you to see the different types of data you can gather and the kind of analysis that the data will permit you to do. And this helps with the statistical analysis that is required. Data can also be classified by levels of measurement, also called scales of measurement. There are four main levels of measurement. They are nominal, ordinal, 
interval and ratio. Nominal scale simply classifies data into distinct categories in which no ranking is implied. You cannot say which is better. They are just mere labels for each of the categories. Examples are religious affiliation. Somebody can be an atheist, somebody a Christian, somebody a Muslim, and so on and so forth. So religious affiliation is on a nominal scale. Gender, male, female, is also on a nominal scale. All of residence is also measurement on a nominal scale. And you can think of other examples. The next level of measurement that we would think about is the ordinal scale or the ordinal level. This kind of scale classifies data into distinct categories in which ranking is implied. You can say which is better. So when a student ranks his level of satisfaction from one to five on campus life, one means that you are very satisfied and five means that you are very dissatisfied. These are known as Likert scales. So you can use one to represent very satisfied, two satisfied, three when you are indifferent, you are in the middle. You don't know whether you are satisfied or not. Four, dissatisfied, five, very dissatisfied. So when you have such rankings, then the data you gather would be ordinary. Another example is when the ages of individuals are regrouped and given some labels, then that data set then becomes ordinary. For instance, if a child, if uh, you have ages between 0 to 12 years, you could consider them as being children. So that would be a child. If someone is aged between 13 and 19 years, you could say the person is a teenager. And 20 to 35 years, you could say the person is a youth. 36 years to 58 years, you could say the person is middle aged. 59 years and older persons, you could say the person is old. So when you gather data on ages and you reclassify them into these, then the ensuing data set then becomes uh, ordinary. Then, the next level of measurement is an interval level. An interval scale is an ordered scale in which the difference between measurements is a meaningful quantity, but the measurements do not have an inherent or what we call a true zero starting point. When you have interval data, you can almost always do any form of analysis on that data, just like ratio scale. The only problem or the only distinction between interval data and ratio data is that with the ratio data, there is a true zero starting point. 
with that of interval, that zero is fictitious or what is known as a pseudo zero or it is a reference point. Zero reflects absence of an attribute. And so, if I ask you, how much money do you have in your pocket? And you have no money in your pocket. You would say zero. Or I don't have any amount of money on me. If I ask you, how many children have you? And you have no child, you will say zero. It reflects absence of an attribute on a ratio scale. However, a zero on an interval scale do not necessarily mean absence of an attribute. Temperature readings is an example of an interval scale. A zero degree Celsius does not necessarily mean there is an absence of heat at that location. Even at freezing point, there is some amount of heat in the system. And so zero is simply playing the role of a reference point, And it has nothing to do with absence of an attribute. And so with temperature readings, you refer to such data as interval. So these are various examples for the various levels of measurement on interval and ratio. So temperature readings, as we have said, is interval. Standardized exam score. Example, SAT, TOEFL, etc. are also interval. Height in inches or centimeters, ratio, weight, age, salary are all data measured in ratio scale. Now let's look at example three. You are to identify each of the following examples, either they are nominal, ordinal, discrete, or continuous. The length of time until a pain relief begins to work. Two, the number of chocolate chips in a cookie. Three, the number of colors used in a statistics textbook. Four, the brand of refrigerator in a home. Five, the overall satisfaction rating of a new car. Six, the number of files on a computer's hard disk. Seven, the pH level of water in a swimming pool. Eight, the number of staples in a stapler. We will leave this for you as an assignment to think of. So in this chapter, we have, or in this lecture, we have reviewed what statistics is, and we have also looked at various uses of statistics. We have also looked at key definitions of what a population is as against what a sample is. We have also looked at primary source of data as well as secondary data sources. We have also looked at types of variables, categorical or qualitative, as well as numerical or quantitative variables. We have also reviewed the various types of data and the measurement levels. 
we will end here and god willing we would meet next week to look at lecture two lecture two will be handled by dr eric now and it is on data reduction techniques so you will be introduced to the various techniques we can use to reorganize data so dr nyaku will take us through thank you very much and god willing we will meet next week enjoy the weekend <laughs>